Okay, so according to A-level syllabus, we're going to start with the gravitational fields. Uh, the first concept is regarding this idea that the gravitational fields are supposed to be radial. Now, what do we mean by this term radial? Radial simply means that the gravitational field lines will be making an angle of 90 degrees with the surface of this respective planet, right? They should be making an angle of 90 degrees wherever they touch, wherever they come in contact with the surface of the Earth, right? And uh, these are going to be pointing inwards because a test mass, if brought closer to the surface of the Earth or any respective planet, will be attracted towards it. Now, what do we mean by test mass? It means that it is a very, very small mass in comparison to the object that we're trying to test. So any massive object brought closer to the object, to this mass is going to be attractive. Now, these are the field lines of, and every field line will be pointing inwards towards and extended they will be pointing towards the center of that mass right every line will be pointing towards the center of that mass precisely because of this idea we will be treating every gravitational object or every astronomical object as a point mass now what do we mean by point mass that the physical dimensions of this object will not be considered they are not important in terms of the formulas that we're going to just do okay so we are going to consider all the distances in terms of astronomy, in terms of uh, gravitational systems from the center of any object, from the center of any mass, be that any planet, be that any star, to the center of another mass or another planet that we're considering. So point mass uh, concept is just here in place, just to uh, keep this thing in mind, that every distance would be considered from the center up to the center of another mass. Okay and the physical dimensions of this planet do not matter. The next idea is gravitational force between the two masses, or between two ma uh, point masses. Uh, we understand that what is a point mass and what is a point uh, considered in space, right? And uh, all of the mass of the object may be considered to be acting at the center. It just helps us to understand or to apply the formula a bit better. Now, Newton's law of gravitation is force of gravity is equal to g m m over r square now g is a gravitational constant that has a value of 6.67 into 10 raised to the power minus 11 m1 could be the first mass and m2 is the second mass that you are considering in that gravitational system now r is sometimes confused as the radius of the system this is not the radius although it is being represented by with the letter r but this is not the radius this will be the distance or separation between two point masses and the center of those two point masses from center to center now let's look at that from a gravitational standpoint let's say that these are two masses that are given to us the first mass is m capital m and the second one is smaller m it does not matter you can change them the other way around as well but larger mass or larger uh, the capital letter represents the larger masses generally or you can say the point of first reference generally so let's say this is the center of this mass and this is the center of this mass sometimes the examiner will give you distances in other aspects or in different formats sometimes he may give you distances in terms of distance above the surface of the planet let's say he may give you the actual radius of the planet and then he tells you about the distance between the surfaces and then the distance or, or the radius of the other planet. No matter however the distances or the separations are given to you, we will always be considering from the center of first mass to the center of the other mass to be the R in the formula above. That is a gravitational, uh, a gravitational force between the two masses. Right? So, if let's say that uh, the values were given to us, uh, let's say that the separation between them or uh, the separation between the masses is 1.5 into 10 raised to the power 11 meters and the mass of the first object is given to us as let's say 6 into 10 raised to the power 24 kilograms kgs and the mass of the second object is 7.1 <coughs> into 10 raised to the power 22 kg then let's find out the gravitational force that exists between them that is attracting both objects towards each other by Newton's third law, right? So we're going to use the formula that is F is equal to G 
m m over r square square of separation let's replace the value 6.67 into 10 to the power minus 11 then we have the first mass 6 into 10 to the power 24 the second mass 7.1 into 10 to the power 22 divided by r square which is again the separation between center to center so 1.5 into 10 to the power 11 whole square the, the things that students generally forget about uh, algebraically is the square of r right so don't forget this and try to do this on the calculators the value that i'm getting for the gravitational force is 1.26 but i'm going to round this off to two significant figures 1.3 into 10 to the power 15 newtons right uh, be advised that uh, the force of attraction is going to be the same from both perspectives. So this is going to be 1.3 raised to the power 15 from the larger mass perspective. Right? And uh, even from the smaller mass perspective, the force will be the same. 1.3 into 10 to the power 15 newtons. As it's a Newton's third law force, it does not matter wherever whichever perspective you're trying to look at it from the the value of the force will still be the same uh the other topic that we have uh, we've done the first two topics the third topic suggests that uh, we need to analyze the circular orbit right so for example uh, if you look at our solar system we understand that sun uh, all the other planets are orbiting around the sun and every planet has their own moon or a satellite or an artificial satellite here we need to analyze how we can involve the formulas for circular motion with the gravitational attraction, right? Okay, so again, the distances will be taken from center of the first mass to the center of the second mass. And let's say that the rotation is actually like this. Okay, so the object is going to complete its rotation towards this side. So how do we start this argument or how do we start the thought process? The thought process is that uh, the necessary centripetal force of course, if you're going to talk about circular motion, we need to involve centripetal force. The necessary centripetal force is being provided by, that is why we are going to put a mathematical equal sign here, is being provided by the gravitational force. Right? So we have two formulas for centripetal force. We are going to place both of them and see what happens. So we have m v squared over r is equal to gravitational force remains the same the formula remains the same so we have r square so this is the first formula that we have and the second you can simplify this further and the second formula that we have is in terms of the angular velocity which is omega so mr omega square is equal to g m m over r square now sometimes students try to memorize this you don't have to do that uh, we know that v is equal to r omega right and this is r of course the distance from center to center the curved speed is omega right the angular speed and the tangential speed which makes an angle of 90 degrees with the uh, centripetal force is tangential velocity v right so if you replace them in this formula over here you will surely get this formula so you can remember just one and work your way through the other one right uh, but please advise that we need to tell the examiner where the gravitational force, uh, where the centripetal force is coming from. So centripetal force is being provided by the gravitational attraction between the two masses. So we are done with point number three as well. Point number four is understand the geostationary satellite orbit. So this is a very, very common question, right? So let's draw the grid. So what they tell you in the syllabus is that it's moving from west to east above the equator, right? So the orbit is like this, west to east. The object is moving like this, right? So we need to make sure that if this is a geostationary orbit, it needs to be above the equator. You need to suggest this to the examiner. And it is moving from west to east, right? So what's basically happening is that a person standing on the surface of the earth, let's say this is the surface of the earth, and a person is standing at this point, whatever satellite it sees on the outer side needs to go with the earth around its rotation, so that to the person who's standing on the earth, it appears exactly at the same point as it did before. So both of them need to be moving at the same angular velocity. 
right? They will be having different tangential velocities, but their angular velocities will be the same. So a, a very generic proof of this comes out something like this, that it starts from the same idea that the gravitational force provides the necessary centripetal force. So we end up equating G M M over R square is equal to M R omega square, right? Now be advised that the distances again are going to be center of the first object to the center of the second object. This is your R, this is your capital M, and this is your small m, okay? All right, so small m gets canceled out with this one, right? The R goes to this side, and we are left with G M is equal to R cube omega square. Now we know from circular motion that omega is equal to 2 pi f, and omega is equal to 2 pi by t. How do we get this? We know that f is equal to 1 over t. That is why we are replacing f by 2 pi by t. Okay, so the next step would be gm is equal to r cube with 2 pi by t being whole squared. So if uh, t is squared and brought to the other side, we are left with t squared gm is equal to r cube 4 pi square. Now let's take gm over the other side. We are left with the t square is equal to r cube bracket of 4 pi square divided by gm, right? So if we take, uh, if we notice this uh, factor, this is a constant. 4 pi square, these are constant values. G is a gravitational constant in it itself. And M is the mass of the planet that you're considering for the geostationary orbit. So really, the equation actually boils down to T square being proportional to R cube, where K will be a constant leading up to 4 pi square divided by G M. Okay? So if you plug in the values for Earth into this, you will find out that the radius of this orbit actually is a constant value. So for T, you will put in 24 hours for the Earth, but of course convert it into seconds, and you'll realize that all the satellites that are on the geostationary orbit will actually be following the same time period, and will, and will be of course at a specific distance above the equator, if they want to maintain that. Okay, so this is our fourth point in terms of this topic. Uh, then we are going to move towards gravitational point or gravitational field of a point mass. What does this mean? Okay, so generally, a gravitational field, electric field, or any field-related concept deals with the fact that how much force is going to be exerted for that particular quantity. So, for example, if you're considering the gravitational field, then this is actually the value of G that we're talking about, which on the surface of the Earth we consider to be 9.81 newtons per kg, right? Now, what is the meaning of this value? It means that for every one kg, if let's say I make a ratio of force with mass, then the Earth is exerting a force of 9.81 newtons for every one kg of mass, right? So if the mass was 2 kg, then the force would be twice or double this value, and so on and so forth, that we actually land at the formula of W equals to mg. The force of gravity multiplied by the mass of the object will tell you how much force is the Earth exerting on the object. But here we have a problem. The problem is that the value of G stays 9.8 when you are very close to the surface of the Earth. You see, if you stay close to the center, from center of the Earth, and up to a few kilometers, let's say, the value of G generally remains 9.81. So we don't have a bit of a problem, we don't have an issue applying or carrying the value of G to be 9.81. But as soon as you move very large distances away from the surface of the Earth, let's say very large astronomical distances that are comparable to the radius of the Earth itself, then the value of G cannot be taken as 9.81. Surely, when you're very close to this Earth's surface, then the value of G will be 9.81. But as you move away from the surface, the strength of gravitational field at that specific level will be not as great as when it, you are close to that mass. So most definitely I should expect a value of G that is going to be less than 9.81 as you move away. So the formula for gravitational field or gravitational field strength actually starts from this idea that this is force per unit mass. 
right? So if you replace the formula for force of gravity, G M M over R square, dividing this with M, then since we are considering per unit mass, we are considering mass to be 1 kg. So this 1 kg gets cancelled with this 1 kg because if there is a mass that we are considering in the Earth's gravity, we are considering it per unit mass, the smallest individual mass that is going to give us the basic calculation. So this M cancels out with this M and we are left with the GM over R square. So that means that uh, the value of uh, gravitation for the gravitational acceleration, G is actually proportional, or you can say is equal to M divided by R square. So if the object is very massive, its gravitational field strength will be higher. But if you move away from the object and your distance R from the center of the object starts increasing, the value of gravitational field strength on that particular level will reduce. To understand this concept better, we're going to look at this diagram from uh, Earth's perspective, right? Now be advised that the formula that we're going to use in this exercise is going to be G is equal to GM over R square. And the value of R will be given at every stage, but the value of G is 6.67 into 10 raised to power minus 11. The value of mass of the Earth is generally standard 6 into 10 raised to power 24 kg. Now what you're supposed to do is I'm going to write down the values of R at every level. You can find out the value of G at every point and you will see that as you move away the value of g changes at the surface it will be something else at different levels uh, above the surface of the earth they will be different so let's write down or let's give you the values of r so the radius of earth is generally 6.38 into 10 raised to power 3 kilometers right now again from the center up to this point this will be let's say for the sake of example we're just taking arbitrary values so 7.0 into 10 raised to power 3 kilometers from the center up to this level, the value of R comes out as, let's say, 8 into 10 raised to power 3 kilometers. And from this point to this point, let's go a bit extreme. Let's say this is 15 into 10 raised to power 3 kilometers. Now what we're going to do is we're going to find out the value of G at this point being highlighted as blue and then we're going to do that again at this level being highlighted as red and then we're going to find out the value of g at this point highlighted as green then we're going to do that again for this level highlighted as black i'm going to do this only for one place which is the red one but for the rest of them i expect you to do that on your own so the value of g calculated at this point this point will be again 6.67 into 10 raised to power minus 11 we're using this formula gm over r squared multiplied by the mass of earth which is 6 into 10 raised to power 24 divided by the r at this point is 7 into 10 raised to power 3 so 7 into 10 raised to power 6 meters whole square be advised that these distances are supposed to be converted into meters right so i'm going to pause the video at this point you're going to calculate for the rest of them and then you can tally the answers with the next stage of the video. See that these are the values that you will experience, that you will expect from uh, this exercise. The purpose of this exercise is just to clarify that at the very surface of the Earth, the value will be 9.8. If you move away, it will be 8.2. If you move further away, it will be 6.3. And very, very far away, approximately 15 kilometers, 15,000 kilometers away from the surface of the Earth, that will be 1.7. So the inverse proportionality in this inequality of R square is very evident that as you move away from the surface of the Earth, the value of gravitational field strength will reduce, right? So this is gravitational field strength. When you, whenever you encounter field strength of anything, that would actually mean how much force is going to be exerted for how much, sorry, how much force is going to be exerted for how much mass for this situation right and similarly if you were looking at electric field strength just a tidbit if you were looking at that then that would be how much force is there for per unit charge so that becomes newtons per coulomb that is electric field strength for gravity that is g as newtons per kg 
how much force for how much mass simple as that right okay so we understand how the value of g is being utilized we understand how it is actually derived and we understand that g approximately at the surface of the earth is exactly identical but we just discussed that if you stay very close to the surface of the earth it stays 9.8 uh, which can be used in calculations of gravitational potential energy, which is MGH sometimes, right? Okay. So now we have gravitational potential. We need to understand what is gravitational potential. What does the definition mean? That is the amount of work done to bring in a unit positive charge or a test small, small test positive mass uh, from infinity to that point. So be advised that, uh, for example, if we have a mass like this one, let's say that this is the Earth. Right, uh, and let's say that from the center of the Earth up to this point, this distance is infinite. It's a very, very large distance in comparison to the Earth's own radius. Okay, so if there was a small mass at this point, it could be an asteroid, it could be a satellite, it could be another planet, it could be another comet, it could be any object. And for the sake of discussion, let's say that the mass of this object is one kg, because we are just discussing about a unit mass, and unit mass means 1 kg to keep calculation simple otherwise it could have been any other mass which we will see in the next uh, incoming discussion right okay so what if we had to bring this mass from infinite distance up to the surface of the earth let's say from that infinite distance to this point so technically this is actually falling down or falling onto the earth as for example if you look at it from this perspective if this is the surface of the earth and the object was coming from this point it is actually essentially falling onto the surface of the earth, right? And what if we wanted to bring an object from an infinite distance up to a certain distance above the surface of the earth, which is technically, for example, is about, let's say, four times the radius of the earth's surface. So if this is the radius of the earth, this is actually uh, discussed in reference to the radius of the earth because the astronomical distance has to be good enough or has to be large enough, has to be great enough to actually involve this calculation of gravitational field strength. If you are very, very close to the surface of the Earth, for example, you are in a very tall building that is, let's say, goes up to 10 floor or 20 floors, your value of G is still going to be the same, average, on an average. So over here, we're talking in terms of astronomical distances, right? So it is going to be compared with the radius of the Earth. But it does not change the fact, is dot, it does not affect that uh, all the distances will be taken from the center of the Earth to that respective point. So if this is that respective point where that object has uh, moved from infinity and eventually settles at this point, it could be orbiting or it could just be staying at this point, right? So how much energy will be consumed or will be taken or will be used from the system to actually do this job? It could be at this point, it could be at this point, it could be at any point, but the starting point of gravitational potential is always infinity and why is that so because at infinity we are very sure about the actual amount of energy that an object possesses and that is effectively zero so when it becomes our starting point or an ending point then mathematically speaking the equation becomes easily solvable now the formula for potential the definition is the amount of energy required now the interesting thing about this is that gravitational potential is actually joules per kg right Again, if you look at this one, this similarly tells us it is joules per kg. How much energy is required, how much work done is required, how much work done is going to be there for the amount of mass that you're going to move in the gravitational field of another mass. So, let's say that uh, the formula for gravitational potential is pi equals to negative gm over r. Now, be advised, this is, there is no r squared in this equation, this is simply r. Now, what is gm and what is r? g is, of course, gravitational constant. m is the mass of the planet that you're referring to, that you are entering the gravitational field of, and r is the separation. Now, what does this negative sign tell you? The negative sign tells you that the system has done work on the object. So, this is actually work done by the system. And what is the system? The system is the gravitational attraction between the masses. You didn't do that. The Earth's gravity did this on, the, on its own. So the energy is actually, is actually being added from the Earth's gravitational field into the mass, right? 
And another perspective to look at this is generally that wherever you find a negative sign in physics in terms of potential or in terms of energy requirement, this basically suggests that work has to be done if you want to separate them, right? So this is just another way of saying that work done if they need to be separated. Now, who is they in this sentence? They is, the first one is the larger mass and the second one is the smaller mass that was brought closer to this. So most definitely, if you want to separate any massive object, it could be us, it could be a chair, could be a small object, could be your bag, could be anything that if these two are supposed to be separated, then work has to be done, then energy has to be provided, and which is what we see in our daily lives. If I want to lift a heavy object or in any object for that matter, we have to invest energy of our own into that object to give it gravitational potential energy. So mathematically speaking, this is another way of looking at it. But generally, what I tell my students is that if the system is going to do the work on its own without your help, the sign will generally be negative. If the system uh, requires some input from you, if you're moving against a field, then the energy will be added into the system and that will be taken as positive. So potential, uh, again, let's look at the unit is GM over R. The unit is joules per kg. Once you have sorted out the difference of potential, the gravitational potential at, let's say, two levels, let's say this is phi 1, right? And this is phi 2, which will be GM over R2. Once you find the change in potential, which will be phi 2 minus phi 1, then you can multiply this with the mass that you actually moved in that gravitational field. And these two, and this formula is actually a representation of MGH that you've already done in O levels, right? Uh, how do we get to this formula and how, let's say, GMM over R is equal to MGH? We're going to look at this right now, okay? So that it becomes easy for us. So we know that G is equal to GM over R square, right? So let's replace MGH in MGH. Let's replace this G and let's replace H with R as all astronomical distances are taken as R, okay? So what we're left with is M, GM over R square being multiplied with one R, right? So one of the R cancels out and we are left with GM M over R. So basically, MGH is a representation of MGH. GMM over R is a representation of MGH. But the issue over here is this, that in MGH, we assume that the value of G is not changing. But over here, we are looking at a certain scenario in which the value of G is changing, right? And we have we seen that, we have seen that over here, that since the value of G is changing at different levels, it's not the same. How do you understand or how do you choose the value of G if an object was moving from one level to another? Let's say an asteroid was orbiting in this level and after multiple orbits it actually falls down to this new level. If I were to uh, find out the gravitational or the change in gravitational potential energy, what would we do? The problem is that the value of G at this level is 1.7 and the value of G at this point is 6.3. If I had to use MGH, the mass of the asteroid is given to me, that is fine. The value of age is given to me, that is fine. How do we figure it out? We have the distances from the center of the Earth up to this point and from the center of the Earth to this point, as mentioned in the earlier uh, values, which is 7, 8, 15, right? So we have the value of age, but we don't, have, we don't understand the value of G. Should we be choosing 1.7? Should we be choosing 6.3? To, uh, to bypass this problem or to fully tackle this problem, what we do is we find the potential at this point we find the potential at this point, and then we take a change in potential that we've just discussed at this point, that there needs to be a change in potential. There needs to be a change in values of G incorporated in the formula of MGH so that we can actually understand that how much energy has actually occupied per unit mass if it changes from one level to another level. Okay? So first, we find the potential at this point by simply applying GM over R over here, then simply applying GM over R over here, then you subtract both of them. You subtract both of them to find the change in potential. And then, since you know that the potential's unit is joules per kg, so if you multiply a mass with it, 
which is evident in this equation. This is joules per kg being multiplied with that mass that you moved in the gravitational field. The satellite, the asteroid, or the comet with that moved in the gravitational field, when you do that, you will only be left with the unit of joules. So mass cancel out with mass. Okay. Similarly, at the last uh, uh, slide, we see the graph of gravitational potential as a negative axis graph, and most definitely comes from the equation that phi is equal to negative gm over r, right? This is the graph of phi. Since there is a negative sign in the equation, this graph has to start from a negative axis. And uh, let's plot some values. So we are not going to get into the exact values, but for the sake of understanding, we know that the formula is phi is equal to gm over r, right? So at the very surface, we are going to experience the maximum value, which is going to be represented, let's say, at this point. This is the maximum phi, maximum potential. What does that mean? It means that the object started to move from an infinite distance and has actually exactly fallen, the green case, and has exactly fallen up to the surface of the Earth. There can be no greater change in potential other than this, right? Okay, because there is still there is no height left above the surface of the Earth which it can fall, so that gravitational potential energy would increase. Okay, for this blue object, we can see that there is still some height left above the surface of the Earth, so mgh can be applied. But no, we cannot use mgh directly. We have to use the change in potential. We will find the gm over r over here. We will find the gm over r at the surface. We take the difference of both of them, and then we multiply this mass which is actually moving in that gravitational field, which is what we discussed. So as you move away from this, the gravitational potential will start falling down, right? This is up to 5R. And why is that so? Because we can see that the phi is actually inversely proportional to R. If you increase R, the potential falls, the potential decreases. Let's look at it uh, from, a pers uh, from a practical standpoint. Let's say that this is the surface of the Earth, right? And this is level... This is level number one, and this is level number two. This is the surface of the Earth. Let's say we had an asteroid that was actually existing at this level. After many orbits, after many orbits, it finally settles down at this orbit. So it is actually coming towards the Earth's surface. So gravitational potential energy is being added into this asteroid, right? So let's say what we do is, first we take the distance from center of this point to this point, then center of this point to this point. So let's find out the potential at this point. Uh, we're going to assume values, but of course, uh, this value will be larger than the other one. So we have G, M. Again, we're taking the same values for the Earth that we, we took just now. Gravitational uh, constant and the mass of the Earth. The radius or the R will be just taken right now on the spot. Divided by, let's say, this is at a higher level. So I'm taking, let's say, 8 into 10 to the power 6. Remember, there is no square with potential. And over here, we have phi 2, let's say. This will be gm. I'm not writing gm completely because we know they're standard forms. And uh, let's say this is a lower level. So let's consider this to be 5 into 10 to the power 6. Okay. Let's calculate them. I'm going to pause at this point. So these are the values that you should get. We'll deal with the negative sign later, right? We're just looking at the values. Now, since uh, you, you can see that the object was allowed to fall down, the system has done work on the system, on this mass, the final answer will be a negative answer. This is how we're looking at uh, the numerical aspect. Now, notice that this is potential, joules per kg, joules per kg. So whatever the mass of this asteroid is or comet is will be dealt later. So first, to find out the gravitational potential energy or the change in gravitational potential energy, we need to find the change in gravitational potential, then multiply this with the mass of the asteroid that actually moved in this gravitational field. So what we do is simply 79.2 into 10 to the power 6 minus 49.2 into 10 to the power 6 multiplied by, let's say that the mass of the asteroid is given as 780 kgs, or the comet is given as 780 kgs. So we multiply 780. Another way to look at this is that the, the symbol or the unit for flux uh, sorry, this magnetic, uh, sorry, this gravitational potential is joules per kg. If you multiply this with mass that has a SI unit of kg, kg, kg cancels out and you're left with joules again, which effectively is our change in gravitational potential energy. Notice, please be advised, if we were in O levels, if the value of gravitation was not changing, then most definitely 
we could have used MGH, but we can't do that right now because the value of G at this level will be something else and the value of G at this level will be something else. This is why we have to use this formula, right? So you take the difference of them, you multiply this with the mass that actually moved in the gravitational field and you will finally find the gravitational potential energy or the change in gravitational potential energy. Be advised if you're at astronomical distances, if you are very, very large distances away from the surface of a planet, then you have to use the gravitational potential concept. You cannot use MGH. If you are very close to the surface of the planet, then of course you can use MGH, but not otherwise. That is all for today. I'll see you in the next class.